Not so long ago, we put a picture of both these cars together on social media, and it caused something of a storm. And we thought we should put these two British icons together. They've both got something in common, in as much as they're both quite ageing designs that had to steadily evolve to stay current in the 1990s when these two cars were new. Now, you would think that the former editor of a Jaguar magazine would choose the XJS, and a former employee of the MG Car Club would choose the RV8. But we thought we'd make it a bit more interesting and swap things around. So what do you think, Jeff? Well, yeah, this will be my first XJS experience, so I'm very much looking forward to it. That would be the easy option, stick with what I know. Wonderful noise, wonderful theatre, RV8. But let's see how the XJS stacks up. Let's hit the road. So welcome to the MG RV8. A, a really peculiar car. It's, um, I don't really know how to describe it really. There's no sense to it at all in, in the 1990s and certainly very little sense to it now in the 21st century. But we really must applaud it for everything it represents. I mean, when I grew up in the 1980s, MG by then was just merely a sporting badge for fairly bread and butter Austin Rovers. The British sports car appeared to have died a death. So when the shutters came down on the MG factory in Abingdon in 1980, it seemed that that was the end of an era, largely because hot hatchbacks had become the norm by then. But then, of course, Mazda caught the world a little bit by surprise by proving that there was a demand for some sort of open top sports car and of course when it unveiled the MX-5 and something else happened around that same time a year before in 1988 British Motor Heritage acquired the license to start producing body shells for the MGB remember it had been out of production for eight years by then and then fast forward to 1990 and the Rover Group has suddenly realised that there probably is some scope to reintroduce a sports car MG this time with the 3.9 fuel injected V8 engine. They had very little budget to play with, so they had to get creative. They commissioned new panels from Abbey Panels in Coventry, specifically the front and rear wings. The bonnet was reconfigured so it could accommodate the 3.9 V8 engine. They were clearly eyeing up the uh, export market, specifically Japan. Japan was going crazy back then for some retro British brands like the Mini. So targeting that market, they had to make sure the car had air conditioning priority over power steering which is why this has got such leaden heavy steering bigger wheels 15 inch wheels fatter tires so they can handle that 190 brake horsepower the rv8 was ready to be unveiled in the spring of 93 with the list price of just shy of 24,000 pounds and of course it was here to sort of invoke all those fond memories of the MGB but it was also here to take on the likes of TVR which had done rather well with the Chimera and the Griffith in particular. In so many ways this car is utterly flawed. The packaging is a disaster really. Remember this is a car from the 60s. It's archaic, it just doesn't quite work. These fat seats are very comfortable but they don't really fit inside this cabin. Anyone over six foot is going to be sort of eating flies. The gauges look a little bit dated all the switch gear, it's all very parts bin-esque, a little bit plasticky, and yet, and yet, what a fabulous car. It, I, I, it's hard to put your finger on quite why it's appealing. I think it starts with the V8 Burble. There's nothing quite like it. It's such a fantastic engine. That power output is relatively modest by modern standards, but it's got oodles of torque and the sound is just glorious, it's so throaty. The XJS that we're comparing it with today has also got that gloriously smooth AJ16 engine. It's a beautifully silky smooth power plant, it's the exact antithesis of this. This is raw, it's brutal. I think what this cleverly does is it modernises the classic car experience enough to still make it appealing. The steering is heavy when you're trying to park, but actually on the road it's fine. It's actually quite a decent bit of feel. The brakes aren't half bad, it shakes, it rattles, and it rolls, but it is huge fun. I, I love its quirkiness, it's, it's eccentric. But what the RV8 did achieve in that time, of course, was it reawakened the MG badge once more. People could start imagining it again as a proper sports car. The economic success of the RV8 meant that MG could sign off on the MGF that came out in 1995 the proper rebirth of MG as we might have known it, it would be all too easy to mock the RV8 for all the compromises that you can see. But 
you can't help but love it. It's great. So, time for a confession. I have never driven an XJS. And this one is a pretty good place to start. It's a celebration model, so from the penultimate year of sale, four litre, around 240 brake horsepower, lovely automatic gearbox, wonderful condition, and what a place to be on a sunny day like this. Fantastic. Of course, by the end, and by this car, the XJS had been around for 20 years. The early cars were uh, famous for being a little bit unreliable and uh, thirsty in the wake of the fuel crisis. I mean, 14, 15 miles to the gallon was the norm. And by 1980, sales were so poor that Jaguar thought about killing the XJS altogether. For 1981, they launched the HE V12 version with a, a redesigned cylinder head, which boosted up the fuel economy and set the XJS on the road to recovery. Two years later than that, 1983, came the first convertible version, the XJSC. Now, it wasn't a full convertible like this one. It had uh, the beams, the fixed beams above the doors and fixed rear quarter windows. But that was the car that saw a debut for the AJ6 engine. Now, the AJ6 was eventually go on to be used in the XJ40, but it made its debut in the XJSC, a 3.6 litre straight six engine. Didn't have a massive performance gap to the V12. With a convertible version as well, it could finally take on the Mercedes SL that it was pitched so closely against. Now, in 1988, finally, there was a full open top cabriolet. And what a looker, what a looker. I mean, this one is evidence of that. For 1990, the AJ6 was enlarged to four litres. And then in 1991, a remarkable change happened. Jaguar had been under independent ownership since 1984 and had started developing an XJS replacement, but it had spiralled out of control. Turbocharging, four-wheel drive, and new owners Ford, well, they didn't want to spend that money, so they looked at the XJS and thought, time for a revamp. Now, this wasn't just a quick facelift. They spent 50 million pounds and 180 panels were revised. The rear light treatment was different. The whole black panel extending across the rear of the car. Now, I'm not a big fan of that, to be honest. I prefer the earlier lights. I think the black panel reminds me of sort of people who used to go into various discount stores and buy cans of Folia Tech to paint their rear lights or put tights over them to tint them. It's very much of its time, but I guess it's part of the car's character. In 1993, there was another facelift, shall we say, more aerodynamic body colored bumpers, and you also got the option of a new engine to replace the AJ6, the AJ16, which was a revised version sticking to four litres. Now this car is a celebration model, one of the runouts, and that means you get these lovely diamond cut alloy wheels, and it's just a lovely place to be. Smooth, it's refined. This is the ultimate countryside grand tour on a day like today. Well, I just can't see how it could be beat. It's not the roomiest of cars, I mean, I'm quite short, so the seat is pushed right forward and the leather's rubbing against the centre console, but it doesn't matter. I guess you could say they look a little dated, but it's so elegant, it's so classy. I mean, when this one rolled out of the uh, Aaron Carr showroom this morning for us to pick it up, it was just, I was gobsmacked. What a fantastic looking machine. And it gets along just like a Jaguar should. This is my first XJS experience, and I'm a convert. Sign me up. Well, Jeff, I really enjoyed that. So um, I don't know what you think. I mean, that clearly has to be the better car, right? It's a remarkable car. The daylight today. Yeah. What a Grand Tourer. I mean, I, I quite happily get in that and drive it to Monaco. For the RV8, I, I, I personally like what they've tried to do with it. It's disadvantaged against something like the XJS for a number of reasons. One, it already came out of production. It didn't have the continuation of production like the XJS. It's, it's been a real struggle on the budget that they had to develop it, to keep it sort of competitive in the early 90s. The, that's the whole crux of it, isn't it? The budget. Rover Special Products had five million pounds to develop that car. Now Ford, when they took over Jaguar, they spent 50 million developing the XJS. Is it 10 times better? No. Well, I would say yes, but maybe I'm a bit biased with Jaguars, I don't know. But. You can't knock the efforts of Rover, and they had a small team, a small budget, and, and they managed to produce something like that, which I know is flawed compared to the XJS. It is flawed, but the theatre of that V8, it just, I, I, I mean, I'm peering over the top of the windscreen, and it's too small inside, and all sorts of things like that. It's got that kind of strange MG Rover kind of lure, is that you know that it's not quite as good as it could be, but it's brilliant anyway.
So listen, you spent the day with the XJS, I spent the day with the RV8. Which one would you now take home? Oh, <laughs> I've got quite a long drive, so uh, I'd have to lean towards the Jaguar, but if I just wanted something to take out and make me smile, I'd take the RV8. Well, that probably works out quite well, because I would take the XJS. That's probably not a huge surprise. I'm a great fan of the XJS, and I've, I've got more of a fan with it as I've got older. So um, I think that's a fair swap. I think uh, Jeff can take the RV8, and I'll take the XJS. Um, perhaps you can let us know in the comments what one you take home. But uh, anyway, thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and uh, we'll see you next time.